Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our industry panel on grand challenges in human computer interaction and design. My name is Nick Diakopoulos. I'm the director of uh, Northwestern's uh, Technology and Social Behavior Program, uh, which is our joint uh, doctoral program in computer science and communication. And um, I'm very happy to, to do my little part to help co-host today as we're all extremely proud to see all of our uh, alums um, uh, from all of our doctoral programs playing such prominent roles in industry. Uh, and today we are uh, looking forward to a very exciting hour of conversation with our distinguished panel. Uh, we have representatives from Google, Facebook, Descript, Education First, and the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, just as a reminder, uh, we invite you to submit uh, questions um, uh, in the QA tool in Zoom uh, throughout the panel, and we'll channel those to our moderator, Liz Gerber. Uh, and it's now my pleasure to introduce you to Liz. Uh, she is the co-director of Northwestern's Center for Human Computer Interaction and Design, uh, and she will introduce you to our distinguished panel and moderate the conversation and QA. So take it away, Liz. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, like I said, this is just so fabulous to have this wonderful panel with us. I'll give brief introductions. I could talk for hours about each of these people, but we'll, we'll keep it simple for now. We'll start with Mark. Mark is a research scientist on the ethical AI team at Google, where he examines the origins of values and social biases in data sets and their influence on algorithm performance. Emily is the director of emerging technology and innovation at EA, uh, excuse me, at Education First and a co-founder of Brave Initiatives, a nonprofit which is training women in coding and design in prisons. Prem is a research scientist at Descript in San Francisco where he creates machines that can understand the auditory world. Isaac is a research scientist at Wikimedia Foundation where he's working to understand and address how structural inequalities find their way online and into algorithmic systems. And finally, Lauren is the director of research at Facebook, where she leads the news feed and stories research team, which focuses on understanding how to best support needs to share and connect with other, others in meaningful ways. Thank you all for being here. What a pleasure it is to see you all here. So I invited you all to um, share, uh, and I'll start with Mark, if you will, Mark. Um, what do you see as the grand challenges in industry? Mark, take it away. Yeah, I'm going to be a little bit um, biased in my sort of just like worldview, um, focusing a lot of my work right now has to do with large language models, um, different kinds of algorithmic systems. And I think one of the biggest challenges that we are thinking through is how to broaden participation in the creation of these systems. Um, there's a lot of different challenges ranging from um, sort of norms and culture around who usually gets to do work on um, technology broadly, but also AI. Um, there's also challenges speaking across disciplinary um, boundaries, uh, which very weirdly I run into all the time. I, I, I work with a lot of people who are very traditional machine learning researchers, and sometimes I'm looking at them with a blank face, they're looking at me with a blank face, and then we just gotta like push forward somehow. Um, but also ultimately trying to get perspectives from folks who are going to be using systems um, or are not necessarily users, but stakeholders in some other way and that they're offering or not offering, but their data is by different processes, uh, part of data sets that we use or um, they're otherwise impacted somehow because systems are used at scale. And I think that that last group of people getting their perspectives is one of the biggest challenges that I see. Thanks so much, Mark. So broadening participation in some. Um, next, let's hear from Isaac and then followed by uh, Emily. Thanks, Liz. Um, I just wanna give a little bit of background on Wikimedia Foundation too, for those who aren't familiar with it to kind of understand where I'm coming from. Uh, so Wikimedia Foundation is the nonprofit. Uh, most notably, we support Wikipedia, uh, but there's a number of other sister projects that we support as well. Um, where support means, you know, keeping the site running, building tools for editors, doing uh, advocacy work, trying to increase access to free knowledge, um, essentially everything but the actual editing of Wikipedia. Um, 
And so that's kind of what I'm bringing to this conversation today. Um, and I'm really glad that Mark said all the things he just said, because it makes my job a lot easier, because I wanted to talk about language equity, uh, which I think is a very related uh, very related challenge. And when I say language equity, I'm thinking, I'm talking about essentially like the language you speak shouldn't be a barrier to accessing of knowledge and tools, um, but obviously right now it very much is. Um, and within Wikipedia, you know, we have over 300 different language communities uh, that have their own Wikipedia. Um, and obviously there's a lot of variety over the amount of content that's available and the tools that are available to these editors. Um, so within kind of design and HCI, when I think about this, I'm thinking about what language communities are we including in our research when we're doing, you know, computational social science type work. Um, if you're a machine learning engineer, what sorts of languages are you, uh, are you designing your, you know, natural language models to support? Um, and just broadly, like whose problems are we, you know, prioritizing for, uh, to support? Um, in some ways, I think industry isn't super well incentivized to do a lot of this work. Many of these language communities are small. Um, there's not a huge amount of kind of, uh, you know, monetary return to some of these things. And the work tends to be very slow. Um, you're building up language resources that English has had, you know, years and years and years of building up online. Um, so I think academia is actually in a really good position to be tackling some of these issues and pushing industry on them. Um, and I don't think it, you know, uh, as far as skills, it touches on a lot of different areas. Uh, so, you know, I think the most important thing probably is having a diverse team of researchers that you're working with so that you're thinking about these problems and, and you know, have insight and connections in with other language communities. Um, and I'll just say one last thing, which is, you know, I'm talking about language equity here, but I think more broadly, it's about building systems with constraints. Um, so not just thinking what is the like highest performing system we can build, but really thinking about, you know, what am I trying, you know, whether it's kind of language coverage um, or privacy or a lot of other things, thinking about what constraints can I bring to this um, in, in when I'm designing these systems. Um, so I'll say thank you. Happy to talk obviously much more about this, but uh, I'll pass on to Emily now. Thanks so much, Isaac. It was great to give a little frame also of your organization. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, um, so I'm gonna take us, I, I love both of those and I'm, I hope we can dig in a lot into both of those themes this, um, over the next hour, but I, I wanted to kind of take us into thinking a little bit about tech in the world right now. And so I've been working at EF Education First for about three years now. And my background was also in working in um, tech in, in theme parks at Disney World. So I've done a lot of work kind of thinking about tech interacting with experiences and kind of enhancing and augmenting those experiences. But uh, to me, one of the big challenges that I've been thinking a lot about is um, how do we help people kind of use tech to look out and not down on their phones? And so I think this like, you know, we build for addiction, we build to kind of pull you in and keep you hooked and keep you in, in the tools that we're creating often. Um, but I, I think the best technologies actually push us to connect and interact and engage and, and see things in, with new eyes. And so I think that's been something as a team we've thought a lot about and, and, you know, all kinds of new technologies are kind of coming out to do that better, like glasses and, you know, different kinds of AR to help you interact and engage more effectively. But I also think where we build these chambers of that kind of force, especially youth, who it's kind of all they know to stay hooked on their phones and older adults alike. Um, so I think I'd love to dig into that a little bit today. Um, and I think, you know, industry-wise, I think they are we are incentivized to keep keep you on your phone. And so I think that it's going to take some shifts to see. It. I think we are seeing people, you know, quitting tools because they find that they're too addictive or they find that they're taking them away from experiences or making them more lonely. So I think, you know, we are seeing some customers kind of shake against that and especially parents who are concerned. But I, I think, you know, if industry can adjust and also take in, into account research around this, I think we'll be a lot better off. So yeah, excited to dig into more of that tonight. Thanks so much, Emily. Appreciate that. Lauren. Hi, everyone. Uh, so one of the things that I've been thinking about for a while um, is just how challenging it is to, you know, build features, products, apps for the diversity of the world. Um, I think that, you know, we all kind of know and learn that if you try to build something for everyone right out the gate, you probably won't build something very compelling, might not serve an actual need. But at the same time, when you narrow in 
uh, you know, what, what populations or groups are you, are you excluding? Are you hurting? And even if you don't intend for those groups to be using your feature, your product, your app, maybe in the future they will because, you know, things evolve. And so when that happens or when you find yourself in that situation, how do you then look back and say, okay, what is a scalable way to ensure that all different types of populations or user groups are having positive, meaningful experiences with my feature, with my product, with my app? Um, and I think scalable is really the thing there because we know that we, we it's just impossible to think about every particular group of people and make sure all of their needs are served, but we can't just throw our hands up in the air and say, oh, well, like, you know, we'll just ignore that. So what are some, what are some systematic scalable ways to, to think about different populations and their use of, you know, your feature or your app? Um, and so one of the things that's funny to me is I remember when I was in grad school, um, writing Kai papers and writing the section implications for design. I'm not sure if it's still called that, but um, you know, I would always do my best, but of course I was coming from a place of not really knowing what it's like to be a designer, be a UX researcher in a company or in a, in a, you know, non-academic environment and actually make those decisions and what are all the constraints that one is facing. And so I think, um, you know, the more that we can make sure that folks in academia understand what it's really like uh, to sort of build products and what constraints folks are under, I think the, the ideas and the recommendations will, will sort of be a lot stronger. And then similarly, I think folks in, in industry you know, can look at some of the information and recommendations coming out of uh, academic research. And even if it doesn't fit their mold right away to say, okay, but there's something here, there's a spark here, there's an idea here. And how can we expand our mind or our processes to do a little bit better or to try things in a new way that it will kind of help us, um, you know, better serve a, a range of, of populations or user groups. So that's, it's high level, but that's, that's quite on my mind. Thanks so much, Lauren. I'm so glad you connected it to design implications and writing papers. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to hear from Prem in just a moment, but I want to remind everybody that um, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A box. And we have um, a team that's monitoring them and we'll, we'll aim to get through the, the questions we can. And Prem, from you. Uh, <clears throat> hi, everybody. I mean, thanks for having me. Um, my uh, sort of uh, the thing that's always on my mind uh, where I work at Descript and before this in grad school was that like content creation is like a very difficult thing for a lot of people, I think, right? Like people have a lot of difficulty creating videos, creating music, creating any sort of, you know, audio based like a podcast and things like that, right? And when there are a lot of barriers to this process, what ends up happening is that a lot of creators just fall out of the pipeline entirely, right? There are people that are, whose voices are like not being heard. Um, whose voice things are not taking off like on you know on Twitter or TikTok or whatever uh, that people are using like um, because the way that they're making their content isn't great right they're running into all these stupid little things that really they stumble over and they end up with this pretty bad end product right even if their message is good you know they might still have a lot of room tone in the background or reverb on their voice and people listen to them like oh this doesn't sound like professional right this probably isn't worth my time like people you know, subconsciously or consciously think that when they listen to a lot of um, content. So at Descript um, and in my grad school and all my work has been sort of geared towards lowering that barrier to entry and uh, retaining people in the creation pipeline as much as possible. And the way that, you know, we've always tackled the problem is by identifying little frictions that can occur um, by, you know, observing user flow and stuff like that. Like, um, making edits, like deleting, you know, words in someone's audio, like um, figuring out like, oh, this is a bad take, this is a good take, all these like little things, right, um, that people need to do, or making good recordings and stuff like that, right, so we just identify all these frictions, and our main goal is to like, make it really like, um, easy to create content. I'm sure a lot of people in the audience the last year have had to make videos for like conference talks, in the last year and I, I'm sure it sucked like I'm sure it was just really hard to do um and you know even little things like how loud should the music be when I'm like talking right some people mix it at equal volume because it's their first time making anything and then you can't understand what anybody's saying right it's like these all these tiny things add up um and really make it a very difficult process so that's kind of 
you know, that's been like the the main like through line of my work for the past like 10 years or whatever at this point. And uh, yeah, I'm just hoping to continue on that. Thank you so much. I'm so struck by the, the diversity of industry uh, representation here is really wonderful. Um, and makes me want to ask, um, given that you're all experts at these particular grand challenges, um, can you reveal for us what some of the biggest or most common misperceptions about some of these grand challenges are? What are things everybody thinks they know about um, broadening participation? What are things people think they know about scaling um, that really aren't quite true based on your position from industry. Would anybody like to take that? Or do we know everything? Uh, I can I can just take sure. it really quickly. Thanks, for a few. Oh, I mean, I think one thing that um, struck me coming from academia into industry is that uh, I came into industry with a very like blue sky sort of mindset towards research, where I really wanted to solve problems that I, you know, that industry actually simply isn't incentivized for, like, at all, right? Like, especially at a startup, for example, like, the pace of research is, like, much more geared towards, like, product and, like, solving, um, like, some little problems versus big problems. And I, I would say the one thing that really helped a lot in changing my mindset was that, like, little problems add up to, like, a big result, right? And, like, breaking it down to that thing is, like, super... Um, important, I guess, in a lot of ways, like uh, just to be able to tackle things in that way instead. So that's one one misconception that I had coming into industry from academia uh, in a lot of ways. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the things, it's hard to really know how products get designed, how products get built until you actually are, are in the thick of it. Um, so for me, uh, it was really interesting to see all the ins and outs and how decisions get made, what the constraints are, what the motivations are, uh, things like that. And, and you see quite a range, you know, based on what you're trying to build and, and you know, what, uh, how ambitious the thing is that you're trying to build. Um, but one of the things that we do try to do is, uh, at least in my experience, is we always want to know the the best knowledge that there is. We're always seeking to to be informed um, when we make decisions, when we go one direction or another direction. You know, UX research does a lot with that. Um, data science can can support that quite a bit. Um, but sometimes, you know, we we do want to engage with academics who really have spent you know decades uh, in certain areas, and they are. Uh, going to provide more knowledge than than anyone in a particular industry setting might be able to when they're coming to a problem, you know, uh, for the first time. And so uh, it's been really exciting for me over my career to have like really uh, highly esteemed folks from academia come in and actually work with us day to day and, you know, share their perspective, but also have them see how we do things and then reflect back. Oh, this makes sense. Oh, I never thought about that. Oh, have you thought about doing it this way? And it, and it feels really like a nice exchange, you know, where we, we kind of have the same goal. We want to build good products for people. Um, you know, we want to make good choices and we're just learning from each other, you know, about how to do things and, and evolving our practices on both sides. So that's been really cool. Um, and we've had a few academics come on my team, you know, spend the summer, spend half a year. And, and those relationships have been really rewarding. Um, the other thing we've done in the past is we've held uh, like workshops or summits where we bring in folks from academia to, you know, discuss or tackle a big problem that, you know, we're, we're working on or we're caring about. And those have been really rewarding, you know, true, true research forum. We always do little surveys afterwards, like, how did you, how did you find this workshop? And, you know, it seems like people get a lot out of it, both the folks in industry and the folks in academia. Again, I think like it's, unless you're really talking to someone who's living it day to day, it's hard to really understand. And, and if you have that understanding, it's going to make your recommendations I think stronger and more likely to be, you know, taken into account and adopted. So that's just a couple of experiences I've had that I, I feel have been really good. That's great. I appreciate the uh, specifics you've offered there. Um, 
So building on building on some of these conversations and maybe getting a little more into some specific case studies or examples to the extent to which you can share them, um, I'd love to hear some success cases of what are things that you've been able to do that have really been able to tackle concretely um, some of these grand challenges that you're that you're facing and with as much detail as you possibly can, so we can really have an understanding of what you're doing day to day to, to tackle this. Mark, can I call on you? Yeah, I was just thinking about this at different like scales. So um, one of the, so thinking about, I guess the problem I mentioned earlier around participation, um, one of the things I've been really uh, excited about is um, an intern project we just had this past summer that involved community-based work in Chicago um, and the structure of the, the project might be familiar to some researchers in, in academia where we are running community-based workshops with community-based partners um, who are themselves community leaders. And we are co-authoring with community members um, who are participating in the workshops. And that's just something that doesn't happen in industry. I'm also in a weird position where like I've, my day-to-day -day is basically that of an academic and I have the privilege to like sit at a company and sort of have insight into how all the internal processes are happening. Um, so I'm not working on a specific product, but um, I was really excited to see this work, which is also being done with uh, researchers, uh, actually Sheena Arete, so at DePaul and um, uh, Christina Harrington as well, who a lot of you may know, um, at Georgia Tech. And so it's this like great confluence of minds and people that I think will stand as a good example of how to do this again moving forward. And so I'm excited for, for that as, as a successful, um, it's still ongoing, but it has so far been successful and I hope for a sustained success. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mark. And I really appreciate you calling out um, those wonderful researchers by name. They are um, doing fabulous work. Thank you very much. Emily, did you have, uh, did you want to jump on here? Sure. Yeah, I, I think uh, one case study for us that I think was interesting, we've, we've been doing a lot around, obviously kids can't be exploring cities as much right now, but we've been, been looking at even from home and when kids can't travel the world, how could they still kind of explore cities where they're living? And so we ended up doing some scavenger hunts that kids could collaboratively do and kind of connecting with others and then actually go and explore. And to me, it was one of the first times I really was seeing like kids, you know, not just looking at their phones, but using it to motivate behavior and to talk to people who had opinions that they didn't necessarily agree with and to learn and, and engage with others. So I think, um, for me, that was one that really exemplified where tech can kind of help spur that interaction and engagement and understanding. Um, and I think one other one that was that was pretty interesting was we did um, some AR experiences where you could actually scan, like we had the, um, during D-Day, you could stand at the beaches of Normandy and scan the air and see what it was like with the planes coming in or scan a photo of a veteran and he would pop out and talk to you about what was it was like on D-Day. So, to me, those were also some really cool, you know, the use of tech to kind of engage and interact and learn um, and, and ask questions kind of in new ways. So I think, I think those were two that I was particularly excited about. Thanks so much, Emily. Yeah, and I'll jump into and uh, build a little bit on, on Mark's point about broadening participation, one of the kind of fun things for us. So with English Wikipedia, obviously quite big, there's a kind of huge resource they're trying to protect. So they're a little bit slow to be interested in experimentation and things like that, a little more conservative in their kind of approach to change, which makes a lot of sense. Whereas a lot of the smaller language communities are really trying to like experiment with things and like try out new things because they're trying to grow. Um, and so in many cases, it's like, I mean, just absolutely fabulous collaborations with these communities because they're willing to put aside a lot of time to kind of talk with us through the issues they're facing and think about and just try out new, you know, new, whether it's new onboarding experiences for editors or kind of new tools for um, you know, like recommending edits they might make and things like that. And so that's been really a lot of fun just having those collaborations. Isaac, did you have a specific community that you've worked with recently that was um, that was exciting to work with when you say, 
I, I'm curious when you think about broadening participation, what what groups are most exciting to work with? Yeah, so we tend to kind of break our communities down to like large, medium, and small, uh, where large okay. would be like English or Spanish, some of these really huge languages that span a lot of areas. Um, the medium sized language communities, uh, these are things like Czech, uh, Korean, um, those, you know, languages that have like a and on Wikipedia I have kind of a community that's like built a fair bit of content, but it's still relatively small, often because it's, you know, focused in a smaller geographic area um, or something like that. And so working with it is, yeah, it's a huge, you know, huge diversity, a lot of very different languages. And you see really different kind of responses and just like, um, like one good example there, it uh, wasn't my work in particular, but some uh, colleagues at the foundation were trying to understand. So on Wikipedia, you don't need an account like to edit or do anything like that. Um, so we're trying to understand kind of like, why do people create accounts? Because really the only real reason is to edit. Um, and we're finding in a lot of these language communities that have come online later um, than say a lot of the English communities that, you know, people were just assume they needed an account to uh, to edit or to like read and access Wikipedia. Um, and it was just really interesting to kind of learn some of these, you know, you call them misconceptions, because, um, but like just the reasons, be, motivations behind why people were taking some of these actions that really kind of helped us understand some of these workflows and, oh, where maybe do we redirect people or does, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So. That's great. Thank you, Isaac. Um, I'm going to move on to another question, which is, really about the business case for overcoming these grand challenges. I think a lot of, you've already um, suggested a lot of you in grad school that you weren't necessarily thinking about the, the business challenges at that point. So I'm curious, um, now that you're steeped in industry, um, what are the business cases for overcoming these specific grand challenges that you each um, have shared? And maybe Emily, I'm gonna start with you um, if you don't mind. Sure, yeah, I mean, I think, well, I'm, I'm thinking now from, from everything Isaac and Mark have been talking about, I do, we've been talking a lot about accessibility online for our tools as well. And I, I think with our, we have an older adults travel group that we focus in on as well. And, um, but not even just for older adults, but I think we've been thinking a lot about, you know, for those who are hearing impaired or vision impaired, or, you know, kind of going onto the site, how are they experiencing the product? And, and at first, you know, it, it could seem like an interesting research problem or a challenge, but of course it's, it's hugely important for the company to be able to serve those audiences as well and be able to have them as customers. And so I think if, you know, those are the best scenarios that when it's actually good for society and also, you know, is, is positive for business as well, you know, it, that's a, a, an ideal combination, but, um, but I think by focusing in on populations who are not fully represented, we're able to serve and, and support so many more people. So that was one kind of quick thought that came to mind um, kind of in, in that vein. Um, and I think also on the like brave sides, as Liz mentioned, I, uh, for the past five years, been helping support a nonprofit that we started um, focused around helping women learn how to code. And it's been amazing because we've kind of moved now into the prison space and helping teach women who are pre-release from prisons how to code and, and kind of building websites for social impact. And it's to me, it's, it's again, an example of voices that are so powerful and have such so much to give and, and society and businesses will benefit if they can open their doors for those populations as well. And so I think for me, even in, in the way we build, it's advantageous to be including different voices and perspectives and we build better systems when we do that. Um, so I think that I'll just, on the brave side, I'm also passionate about that. Thanks for bringing in that work too. Mark, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, I can definitely echo um, a lot of what uh, Emily is saying about, there's this kind of broad um, sort of view or argument to be made, I think, about, you know, being more inclusive means supporting more people um, and from a product perspective, more users, more positive experiences. Um, uh, but I also struggle sometimes actually to make a, uh, a case uh, or to, our, I, guess, I guess, like articulate in a uh, business sense. It's definitely not my first, um, my mind doesn't start with those uh, questions. I find myself kind of reverse engineering. Oh, these are certain research questions I have or or certain issues that I think needs to be audited in a certain way. And then I, I, I can sort of say, let's avoid a PR scandal, right? Like <laughs> scare a business, like that's one way. You don't want to lose money either. Um, 
but it is something that I do find to be pretty tricky. Um, and less so at the level of, say, getting buy-in from leadership about identifying that an issue is important, but really um, peers and people who are maybe just slightly above where I am because um, sometimes and oftentimes um, there's extra steps that you're adding to somebody's workflow. Um, and especially when it's not the norm to have a very inclusive process, it means starting out changing people's work practices and just because like changing your routine is easier said than done. Um, and it can be really frustrating for somebody. I'm sure if they see me knocking on their door, like, hey, uh, I think I know how I can tell you how to do your job better. Like that's never gonna, <laughs> that's not gonna convince many minds. Um, and so I think that's where the biggest challenge for me lies and, and so learning that language of how to um, bring people in in really compelling ways. Because um, I think at the high level, a lot of folks are really interested, um, but they're spelling out in a very detailed way, hey, um, this is how we stand to push away users or um, create systems that aren't working as efficiency. Even if I myself uh, am less interested in say specific um, benchmark accuracy compared to some other way of me measuring performance, I still need to make a case around the metrics, benchmarks, and honestly um, sort of references that other folks have been using and still care about. Thanks so much. Prem, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, sure. So, I mean, the business, like looking at things in terms of like a product lens versus a research lens, it's like a very kind of new experience when you enter industry. And like one thing is that like all the things that you care about in terms of research are just not going to ship. Like they're not going to make it into the product. Like for the, for like so many things are just not going to make it. Like solving like certain problems in computer audition, those don't have any near term application for our product, for example, right? Even though they're things that I really cared about in grad school. So like in grad school, I worked like a lot on like unsupervised learning and like self-supervised learning. But it turns out in industry, supervised learning just works better, right? Because like, if you just get the data set and then make it work and stuff like that, like a lot of the, a lot of the times that's gonna be the way to go, right? So like you end up shifting like gears quite a bit um, towards a different set of problems um, than might than you might have wanted to work on. Um, but it does open up kind of new challenges and things like that. And the other thing is you end up focusing a lot on tinier, like, like I said before, like tinier things, like getting things to actually ship uh, requires like a lot of meticulous sort of research, highly extensive QA, for example, like we ship models that um, like resynthesize your voice in like good recording conditions, right? So the QA that we do for that is like way more intense than anything I did in grad school, right? Because if we ship it wrong, then people start yelling at us on Twitter and that's bad, right? So, I mean, like there's a lot of things like that that end up happening. Um, so like where you are, like the fun part of research, I mean, the job as a whole is fun, but the fun part of research is like, uh shorter than it was in grad school in a lot of cases so i mean i spend a lot of time really trying to extract as much fun out of that period before i have to move on to the painful period of shipping it um so that i mean like things like that have shifted a lot for me in industry uh, okay then i overall, have to push back Prem, and then say what's more fun about industry than <laughs> academia there's got to be something that's more fun i mean you it's get better a, on the other side yeah when Orange. you ship something <laughs> Yeah. You're shaking your head, Mark. Come on. Uh, can I, I was going to say PTO. <laughs> yeah, PTO and PTO great. stands for what? Paid time off. Um, having a nine to five is wonderful. Although uh, many of my coworkers um, have carried over their uh, grad school working uh, habits, which is not good. I will. I will say for me, one of the, one of the multiple more fun things was you get to work with people with a lot of different skill sets that you know, I really was not exposed to in grad school. And when all those people come together, you can actually make a feature or a product and you can actually put it into the world and you can do it on a relatively short time frame. And you can debate the merits of whether it needs to be a longer time frame or not, but actually making things, in my case, software, like making software, designing things and putting them out into the world and having people use them and get value out of them, I, I think is very, very fun. 
you know, maybe you could pick another adjective like fulfilling or rewarding, but um, it's not abstract, right? It's like you made a thing and you put it out there. And, and that is pretty exciting. Lauren, do you have a specific example of something you've worked on that we might know about? Um, yeah. Uh, back in the day, uh, my team and I worked on the original uh, Facebook reactions. So those are the emoji that um, you can leave on a post. So before that, you could just leave a like, a thumbs up, and now you can leave uh, a range of, uh, of uh, pieces of feedback. So um, we did a lot of research to, to figure out what should they be. And, uh, you know, we had to do research in a number of different ways. So, okay, what should the set be from this many options down to this many? Um, how is it going to look on different sized phones, right? So at the time, the biggest phone looked like this. So maybe we could fit one more, but what about all the people who have smaller phones? Maybe we shouldn't put that one extra one um, to, you know, every, everything in between. So very like abstract, you know, emotional type research to very specific usability, pick, you know, pixel here, pixel there kind of research. And, um, you know, we were doing it because we had a lot of user feedback that there were a lot of cases where giving a like just didn't feel right. It wasn't allowing people to express the thing that they wanted to express. So we were solving a, a real user need. So it felt good, like a good pursuit, um, not something that we were doing, you know, for, for a different benefit. So, uh, you know, that was early on in my uh, time and, and that was pretty, that was pretty exciting. And it sounds like you worked with a diverse group of folks to get you there as well from oh, yeah. psychologists to, I mean, tell us more about the folks you worked with to, to realize that feature. Well, I think, uh, you know, we worked with design. So I'm in the research side. We work with designers, product managers, engineers, uh, data scientists. Um, we consulted a lot of academic literature. Uh, we looked at, you know, the state of the art that was uh, out in different uh platforms at that time. Um, we tested in a lot of different countries. We did all sorts of different, um, you know, research methods because uh, we knew this was going to be a big change. So we wanted to get it right. Um, and uh, yeah, it was really, it was a good experience. Thanks so much, Lauren. I appreciate the specificity. And I, I think how much those, even that way of communicating has translated into so many other products we now use as well. Um, I tried to resist giving you a thumbs up when I when you were talking. But, uh, thank you for making that possible. Um, my next question is one of the things, and Mark hit on this a bit earlier, um, but it's really around the naysayers. So the the folks who say no, that's not really a grand challenge. We we don't really need to broaden participation. We don't really need to scale. Uh, we don't really need to. Um, address language equity. Uh, we don't really need to get people to look up from their screens. What what strategies do you use to overcome um, those people's perspectives and, and continue your work? Or do you just ignore them and, and walk on? Love to know. Isaac, do you have, you're smiling, so I'm gonna assume you have a thought there. Do you have any I was going to ask whether we're allowed to answer that we can ignore them. Uh, I think, <laughs> I mean, honestly, sometimes that's the correct way to go um, because, yeah, uh, you don't have to convince everybody. You just need to convince enough. Um, so I think that's actually a very valid answer. Um, otherwise, I mean, we're researchers, so try to gather all your data points and make some sort of, uh, you know, um, make some sort of reasoned argument for it. And, you know, I think that's valuable um, just to make sure you have your own ducks in, in order and can, you know, answer to yourself to why you also think it's important. Um, but, you know, try not to waste too much time on just trying to convince everybody. And honestly, you know, uh, demonstration goes a long way too. Like, uh, you know, if you want something to to be done and you think it's important try to do it and once you can show people like hey here's a prototype or like here's why you know here's a success story um you'll have a lot easier time convincing folks that it's it's worth pursuing do you have a concrete example to illustrate that isaac uh yeah sure like um especially around language equity um when the foundation was building a lot of kind of our original machine learning model, the state of the field was very much kind of, um, you know, you build a model for English and then you think about building a model for another language. Um, and with some of the stuff that we were doing, um, for instance, I was, uh, we have a model that's just like, take a Wikipedia article, uh, like label it with a high level topic, you know, but it's Mount Everest, it's like, oh, it's about sports, it's about geology, uh, Nepal and, you know, China. Um, and so I was able to go in like, 
and, and build models that were like, okay, we can do this in lots of different languages, you know, and I'm not going to go into all those details, but like, we don't have to do this language by language. Um, and by being able to kind of prototype and show people like, hey, this actually works quite well, like, and we get much higher coverage, um, was able to build a lot more kind of momentum around, oh, maybe we should take a step back from the way we've been thinking and approaching a lot of these designs of like, let's see if we can do this in English and then think about building for other languages and kind of take that step back and say, okay, what would it look like to build this for all languages? And then maybe think about, you know, narrowing down and, and kind of fine tuning for, for other languages. Thank you so much, Isaac. Thanks for the specifics. Emily, did you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. I, I would echo all that. I think we have really found that having like stories and even like having a voice of a customer saying, you know, their thoughts around something has been so helpful. I, I know the data has, has been super helpful, but like, I remember um, as a specific example, we had this video of a teacher just talking about how much she hated their students being on their phones all day, kind of sitting at McDonald's when they were in France and could go exploring, but we're, we're all on Wi-Fi sitting in, in the, in the hotspot there. And so, and we just always kind of like would think of her and like start a lot of our presentations with her kind of talking and um, so I do think having sometimes a voice or a story or a face can can make an issue even more personal and real. We've also had similar ones around kind of supporting accessibility on the site and having some voices of some of the customers who've gone on and, and can't see what we put up there and the options for them and that kind of thing. So I do think like a combination usually for us of really having good data showing it and and usually that's, you know, quantitative data showing the numbers, but also having a face or a voice to make it really like human and personal has helped us. That's great. I love the vision of a teenager looking at their phone in the McDonald's in France. I can, I've seen that before. I can relate. Absolutely. <laughs> That's lovely. Um, we're going to switch over to audience uh, questions at this point. We've had a lot of great ones coming in. Um, and so I encourage the audience, please put your um, question in the Q&A if you like, and we'll, we'll aim to get, get to it. Um, and the questions really range the gamut. So we're just going to going to jump right in. Um, the first one is directed specifically at you, Isaac, um, which is a question around, have you seen growth in languages as Basque and Catalan? Um, and does it correlate th with the desire for independence? So I think this is a question around language and politics as it plays out in Wikipedia. Sure. Um, so Basque and Catalan, for folks who don't know, are languages spoken in kind of Sp Spain, uh, that area. Um, and they do have separate language editions on, so there's a Spanish Wikipedia, there's a Catalan Wikipedia, there's a Basque Wikipedia, um, and uh, Basque and Catalan have been around for a while, almost as long, you know, since like 2002 or so, 2003, somewhere in there. Um, I think Catalan Wikipedia was maybe the second language after English, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and I mean, there's a specifics of whether those, and I don't know the specifics to that answer, whether their growth has correlated with politics, but I do think that um, there's some really interesting big research questions around what sort of, um, you know, uh, offline things that factor into the growth of Wikipedia and like these knowledge communities and participation online. I mean, I'm sure a lot of us have been studying kind of COVID-19 effects on participation and engagement and things like that, which isn't, you know, the same as kind of political movements. It's another kind of huge uh, change. And, and things that then you ask the question, okay, what does this mean for us? And, uh, you know, is this a sustained change or is this something smaller? That's great. Thank you, Isaac, very much. Um, this next question I'm going to direct towards Mark um, and Lauren, which is, if you're trying to build for people who speak different languages, or perhaps nobody on your team speaks that language, how do you handle the, um, the challenge of knowing whether it's working and if people are using it in the way you want them to work? So as we're trying to broaden participation, this means a lot more language. I'm curious, I'd love to hear Mark and Lauren's thoughts on this. Yeah, happy to quickly say, so one of the things, I guess on different time horizons, like in the longer term, um, one of our approaches is hiring people who speak those languages. Um, at least I can speak for my team and area within the company, which is massive. Um, but there is still the very practical problem of wanting to support and develop systems now. 
And um, currently the way that works is a lot of uh, like contracting um, with people who, which isn't ideal. Um, I think primarily because you're looping in people at the evaluation stage of systems and not taking into account their needs from, from the outset. Um, that said, I'll say that <laughs> a lot of my work uh, involves not just convincing people of the importance of um, broadening participation, um, but also broadening participation earlier in the design and development pipelines. So um, I think uh, something Isaac said earlier, I'm forgetting your exact words, but just like demonstrating to people is super, super important. Um, I find myself currently, uh, so Google a couple months ago announced a sort of reorganization where we have this like responsible AI division. Um, and a lot of our work right now is like jumping in and sometimes getting up to speed at like at a crazy pace to work with some teams to show that, hey, we can, we can help you do this thing. And we had so little time. Imagine if we did this from the beginning and, and using that as like currency. Um, yeah, so. Uh, do you have uh, a concrete example you can share of that, Mark, or? Oh. Uh, Maybe not. I don't think so, oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no problem, thanks. <laughs> Lauren, do you have uh, anything to share on this? Yeah, so at a very concrete level, I mean, there are some uh, heuristics that at a bare minimum folks can do. So for instance, um, testing things out in a left to right language. If you work at a company where you are designing and functioning in a you know right to left language or things like that. Um, German has some really, really long words. So a lot of times we're like, what does it look like in German? And we're like, oh, it looks really bad in German. Like maybe we should change our design. I mean, those are very practical, like bare minimum things you can do. I think at a higher level though, um, before the work even starts, you have to ask yourself as a team, how are we going to define success, uh, which could be some sort of goal metric or it could also be uh, an absence of a bad experience. And so there are things that you can do to kind of uh, hold yourself accountable and to try that out. So, you know, I, I agree with Mark, like hiring plays a role. Um, we're lucky enough at Facebook to have a really uh, large um, employee base where we can actually actually find people for almost every language who speak who are native speakers to say, hey, can you take a look at this? Hey, can you can we run this by you? But there's a lot more things that you can do and you can take you know, responsibility for, for defining success and, and having people help you think through, you know, how should we define success, both in something added and making sure uh, we're not adding anything negative, and then hold yourself accountable to that. Thanks, Lauren. I, I appreciate it. Mark, go ahead. Sorry, Don't I wanted me. to jump in. I was really curious because um, I'm realizing I was looking at one of the questions. Um, I wanted to one shout out Minsook. Uh, your question. Um, I have a lot of, lot of, lot of thoughts on that. Um, so I just wanted to like flag that. Feel free to reach out to me at, at some point. But um, in sort of in that question was this um, note about like whose participation. And so I was kind of curious for what the range of like other other people, I guess, other than the researcher participating looks like for different folks um, in your work. Um, when, like for me at least, to that's rude of me, I'm putting the question, but I'm answering it first. But um, uh, I first think about like disciplinary participation, um, which fortunately there's a lot of room for in my team. My um, boss is a sociologist. We have an anthropologist on the team. Um, we have NLP researchers. Um, in addition to like the user side of things and the people who would be using systems. So there's this like dis disciplinary bit and also um, like non-tech worker user uh, experience and expertise, I would say. I can, I can chime in on that. Um, so, uh, we do a lot of things like very transparently to the like point of our work. So for instance, like the tasks I'm working on are public and anyone could see those and like see my progress on them and go in and like comment on them. And because there's like this 
huge community of editors who are really interested in a lot of these things. Like people actually do go in and say like, oh, I see that you're thinking about it this way, but like, let me point you to this example um, over here. And we actually, you know, uh, get a lot of, and that sounds like chaotic, but actually works pretty well in, in practice. Um, and then we also have like community conferences that we attend and so talk to really engage kind of organizers and editors in the space and, and really get to have these like close conversations. So I think we're pretty lucky in that we have a uh, not always a like non-tense relationship, but we have a very strong relationship with the communities that we're serving. Um, and so we get pretty direct access to a lot of very people willing, very willing to like talk with us and, and fill us in on, on what they're working on. Thank you, Isaac. Um, there's a question here from the audience, which is really around tech culture versus inclusivity. And I'm, I'm going to read the question directly. I think it's well phrased. Um, so Lauren Lynn asks, how do you balance the fast mentality of tech companies um, with the importance of moving, of moving slow to ensure that you're intentional and inclusive when designing? Who would like to take that on? Yeah, I'm happy to start Emily? there. Yeah. Right? Um, I definitely, I was, I, when it had come up as kind of the things I like about industry and also miss about academia, I will say the thing I both love and also find super hard is that we have to move so, so quickly. Um, and so sometimes, you know, we're pushing a feature out, you know, without having done much research or, and just kind of hoping that it works or, you know, and, and certainly in that process, a lot of unintended consequences can come out that as a, you know, with research and time, you'd really be able to kind of work through. And so, I, I do think that that mentality is one that even as a team, just literally today, I had a, a timeline that we just pushed back two weeks just to kind of give the team a little bit more breathing room, the chance to actually like interview customers and get their thoughts about this feature that we were trying to build. And so I think I think there is something I, I, like such an advantage of coming into industry with that academic mindset and really thinking critically about what you're building. And I, I think it's one of the reasons why I believe we need researchers going into academia and also, uh, and also going into industry, because I think coming in with that mindset of, you know, how is this shaping the, the user? How is this impacting the way that they feel and engage? And I know we, I thought about that when I was at Facebook, a lot of them on the team there too. And I think just that mindset of, of really, you know, the user first or user-centered design, customer-centered design, um, human-centered design broadly, I, I think changes the way you build. So I'm trying to, I'm, at least in my team, slow, slow the team down at moments when we can, just to give that breathing room to say what how can we actually create this in the right way um, and, and look out for every unintended consequence that might come to the extent we can control it um, while also moving fast and not slowing too much that we miss, miss the moment too. Anyone else have a turn back time machine? Any technical solutions to this? Okay, wonderful. Um, Thank you. We're just near the end of time. And so I would love to um, wrap this up by hearing um, some words of wisdom from each of you. Um, we have many people listening in the audience right now. And I'd like um, to invite each of you to speak for a minute or so about what's something um, after hearing this conversation that you would like the audience to, to do um, based on this conversation. What do you think? How do you think they can help tackle these grand challenges and support you in helping? tackle these grand challenges. And um, I will let, uh, how about Lauren, are you ready to go first? Okay, <laughs> let's start with Lauren. Sure, and I might be, I was trying to look through the questions. I might be imagining this. I thought someone maybe asked like, what were the skills I learned, we learned in grad school that most helped us uh, in our roles now? So I'm gonna like parlay that question into my answer here, which is that, um, there's no, there's no substitute for doing high quality research. Um, my, you know, I lead a big team. Uh, we do a lot of research, but I'd rather do half or a quarter of the amount of research as long as it's done well um, versus to just churn research out. And the reason for that is because when you do research well, that means you can rely on the insights. And when you can rely on the insights, it means you can really make good decisions. And so to me, like, that's what I learned how to do in grad school. I learned how to do high quality research and that's taken me far and it's taken a lot of the folks on my team uh, far as well. So 
that would be the, the thing that I would want um, folks to, to know that there's so much value in doing whatever setting you're doing it in. I think it's valuable in industry. Um, it's valuable, of course, in academia. Um, and I think we won't be able to solve some of these. There's a lot of things that are going to have to go into tackling some of the challenges that got brought up today. But I do think that in making decisions about how we go forward, we want to be informed by insights. And we can only get good insights if we're doing high quality research. To me, that's like the foundation of everything. Yes, you need leadership. Yes, you know, in order to uh, uh, get a strategy, you won't always have all the information that you want. You know, of, of, there's other things too, but but you have to have that. So if you're ever sitting wondering, you know, why am I in this, you know, 10th methods class or whatever, uh, you know, it's worth it. That's my opinion. Thanks, Lauren, for the shout out to methods. Appreciate that. <laughs> Graham, do you want to follow? Uh, yeah. So for me, grad school was kind of like, it was becoming like a, getting a style for research was like the most important thing for me, like getting a sort of unique perspective on tackling new problems. Because as you go through your career, I think like tech changes, methods change, like a lot of things change. And the only thing that really doesn't change or really matures in a linear sort of fashion is how you approach problems, how you frame problems and things like that. And like for me, um, I mean, the job I have now, it's just like getting a really good eye for friction is like kind of what I call it, like looking at how somebody uses something or looking at some sort of maybe higher level thing that's happening is be like, hey, there's, you know, there's friction here, right? And then paring down all of that friction into things that that are currently in your tech skills bucket, right? Like I've got deep learning skill right now, right? Like that has been the thing that I've really improved on since leaving grad school is just like my deep learning skill is like, you know, very much, much higher than it was then because of the people I work with and things like that too. And because of product pressure and stuff like that, right? Like a lot of these things really, it's like a, you know, uh, it's like a pressure chamber for your skill set in a lot of ways. Um, but I would say that's like the most useful thing that you can take from grad school is developing a unique style and a new, unique way of tackling problems. Because at the end of the day, that's what you bring to the table is like your perspective on things. And that's like the most important thing that you can have on a research team is a lot of competing perspectives and things like that, because it takes a lot of like minds to solve these hard problems. So I love it. So study hard and uh, trust in yourself. That's how I'm going to summarize those two points of view. <laughs> Emily. Yeah, I, I would say I kind of echoing on both. I think, you know, bring, bring your perspective out into the world. I, I think what I've found is sometimes research can stay in the silos and, and we speak a certain language together and kind of uh, connect and dialogue and grow in kind of th those circles. But I think what I've found is and I think Lauren, I was resonating when you were saying earlier, like how much industry needs that research and wants to pull in researchers and listen to them and learn from them and grow, grow with them. And I know my team is, is so like dying for that of like hearing what practices are out there, what's working and what researchers are saying about accessibility and belonging, et cetera. So I just think no matter if you go into industry or academia, like ensuring that you're kind of putting your work out there and, and bringing in that unique perspective, which I think you get to grow and build in grad school um, and, and make sure that you're kind of not keeping that kind of in, in you know, one in a paper, <laughs> but like getting it, getting out there and sharing it. Because um, I, I, I truly think bringing that H HCI lens into what we're building and where technology is moving is so critical. Um, and so I think bringing kind of the diverse perspectives that we each have um, will make every, everything kind of stronger. So I guess it would be in short, like make sure you're sharing it and, and getting it out there. <laughs> Believe in yourself, study hard and share. Love it. Uh, Isaac, are you ready? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll come back to, I think, my point about constraints, because, you know, when you transition from academia to industry, uh, you often get access to like a lot more data and like power and all these things. And it's really tempting to just like want to build bigger and bigger things and like, you know, really just like use all this data you have. Um, and I think in many cases, it's actually very valuable to kind of set yourself constraints. It really helps with the design. You know, for me, I've talked a lot about language coverage and making sure what I'm building isn't just going to work for a single language. Um, but, you know, this can also be things with privacy, transparency, all sorts of, you know, constraints that you can bring into your work. And I think they 
bring a lot of value. And so just thinking about what are those pieces that are really important to me? And like, even if I uh, get all this access to data and things like that, like what, I don't need to use it though, right? You don't have to, you don't have to consume it. You can kind of push back at on some of that mentality. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Isaac. Um, Mark, you wanna wrap us up here? Sure. Um, very much on uh, this, kind of, I think a broader theme of like communication that's come up. Um, I like I jotted down a note, which was ask yourself how to convince, like when you're thinking about a project you wanna work on or you're trying to convince somebody that a research question is important, I think it's really great to ask yourself. And if you're in, you know, interested in being in industry or at least working with people in industry or outside of the, um, uh, academia, ask yourself, how, to, how do you convince people? How do you persuade people? How do you get buy-in from people who aren't sitting at the university? And I feel like that sounds, maybe it sounds obvious and or it should be, but I mean, we spend so much time refining our language and our writing for where we publish that we forget that like almost nobody actually speaks that way or reads that way. Um, we, are, we are a unique uh, in good ways and bad ways. Um, set of communicators. And so I think um, kind of to um, your earlier question about, you know, what do you say to naysayers? Um, I, I can't point to like a Kai paper and say, didn't you read the recommendations I made in my la last two paragraphs? They're like, that's not a solution. Like, how do I work with that? Um, and so I think, um, yeah, being able to articulate to different audiences, whether it's, I don't know, going home, Thanksgiving's coming up. Um, if your parents are not academics, try convincing them of your next research study and see what they think. Um, I used to dread going to parties with friends while I was a grad student. They'd be like, what do you do? What do you research? I'd be like, oh God, they're gonna be like, why is this important? And then I have to answer that question and it can be hard sometimes. Um, and I'll do a quick, give a quick plug to um, the um, center, oh, I'm, actually forgetting if this is the exact name, but the Center for Civic Engagement on campus. Um, I took their GEO seminar, um, which was sort of framed around how to be like a public scholar. Um, but one of the core points of that was how do you communicate to people outside of universities, outside of academia? Because you have important knowledge and, and questions you're researching for broader communities. So those broader communities should have an access point to those conversations. Um, I think that's a very, It'll be a very useful skill, I promise. Thank you so much, Mark. And I loved how all of your comments actually were framed around the grand challenges in some ways of broadening participation um, and inclusion of many different people. Um, so thank you so much for all those, both articulating the grand challenges and then things that we can um, in the audience all do tomorrow. Um, thank you so much. It's been such a privilege. We're so lucky to, to know all of you and to have um, had the opportunity to work with you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day. Um, so round of applause for our illustrious panel, and uh, we hope you have a very productive uh, remainder of your day. Thank you so much.